Hey everyone, welcome back to the DP700 exam preparation series. Today, we're gonna to be looking at ingesting and transforming specifically batch data. Now, I wanted to just talk through some of the conceptual stuff first. So choosing a data store, choosing a data transformation tool within Fabric. I'm also gonna do a bit of an overview of shortcuts and mirroring. Then in the next sessions, we're gonna be getting hands-on. We're gonna be showing you a lot of data transformation techniques. Firstly in T-SQL and then in PySpark, but I've just broken down this section into a few different videos because there's lots to get through. So let's start with choosing a data store in Fabric. So within Microsoft Fabric, we have three main analytical data stores, the lake house, the warehouse, and the event house. And the table that you're looking at here comes directly from the documentation. And I would recommend using that as the source of your revision for DP700. This is the Microsoft view on the differences between these three things. So I'd recommend using that as the central resource. You can find this just by searching for Fabric Data Store Decision Guide on Google, it'll be the first result. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk through some of the most important things that I recommend you learn about here, differences between these three data stores. And I'll also be towards the end, adding some of my own thoughts about some of the things that aren't mentioned on this list that maybe won't come up in the DP700, but are useful, I think, to know about. So when we talk about making a choice between these data stores, one of the core things is around the skills that you have within your team already, right? Because the lake house is centered around Spark. So you're gonna be wanting to write things like Spark code, PySpark, Spark SQL, so if you don't have those sort of skill sets in your organization, specifically on the write operations here, we'll talk about the differences between writing and reading to all of these different data stores in a minute, but the skill sets that you have in your team and or existing code bases that you have within your team is gonna be a clear deciding factor. So if you're migrating from Databricks, for example, you might have Spark code that you can fairly simply refactor into Fabric Spark code. If you're primarily a Microsoft SQL BI background organization, you've got T-SQL developers, database developers, then you might want to create a warehouse as your data store. And if you're dealing with real-time data, then obviously the event house, which includes the KQL database, right? That is gonna be your primary data store that you're gonna be using for at least for ingesting in the first instance. You can also write to other data stores like the lake house after you ingest the data, but we'll look at that more when we talk about real-time data. So skills is one of the main decision points. The other one to talk about is the type of data that you want to store and ingest. So this is this line here. So if you have unstructured data, so this is essentially anything, right? So it could be images, voice data, you know, anything that doesn't have a traditional structure, then the lake house is a good, Thing for that, right? Video as well, because essentially it can store any types of data you want. Say you're doing some sort of machine learning, computer vision, ML model that you want to create, and you want to ingest thousands of photos, then the lake house is where you're going to store that because the lake house has the files area and the structured managed delta table area. The warehouse is traditionally mostly only structured data. Now they have recently added some support for JSON storing JSON columns in your data warehouse, but traditionally it's mostly a structured environment, right? Tables and columns, columns and rows. Now the event house is fairly flexible, right? You can ingest streams in an unstructured way, semi-structured, AKA JSON or structured data as well. It's fairly flexible in what it can, you can ingest into an event house. So one of the key defining decision points is what tool do you want to be using for writes? This is why they've separated them onto different lines here. We've got read operations and write operations. Now, the fact is that these days, it wasn't particularly the case right at the beginning of Fabric, but nowadays you can read essentially data from any of these different data stores from the other environments, right? So from a lake house or from the Spark notebook, for example, it's fairly simple to read data from a lake house or a data warehouse as well, and vice versa as well. Like within a data warehouse, you can fairly easily read data from T-SQL, so from your warehouse tables and from lake house tables via the T-SQL endpoint. Where these differ is in the write operations. So if you want to write data to a lake house, currently it's easiest to do that with the Spark engine. So using PySpark, 
R, Spark R, Spark SQL. And equally, if you want to write data to a data warehouse, that's best done with T-SQL. So the differentiator here is not particularly on the read side, but on the write side. Now, this is also important when you're talking about building semantic models, maybe not as a data engineer, but you're setting up an architecture for the semantic modeler, where it doesn't particularly matter which of these you choose, because all of these you can set up semantic models to read from either like the SQL endpoint of these or the data warehouse. Event house is slightly different because of they have their own real-time dashboarding artifacts that again, we'll look at in the real-time section, but at least for the lake house and the warehouse, it doesn't particularly matter what you build your semantic models from. You can read from either of these quite simply. So one of the other defining features of data warehouses in particular is that it allows multi-table transactions, right? So this is this point here. So that's not supported in lake houses, but it is supported in warehouses. If you've got anything time series, or you, if you're in a VP700 and you hear something about time series or geospatial, normally this is always going to be event house and KQL databases, because there's a lot of analysis functions and functionality embedded within that KQL database for well, obviously time series data, because it's a real time platform. That's the core focus is time series analysis and geospatial stuff as well. Now that's not to say that it's not possible to, I think they're adding some geospatial functions and features into the data warehouse in particular. I've seen them building new features in that regard recently, but it's probably not going to come up in the DP700 because these are very new features. So there's a few things that are not mentioned in this list that again, probably won't come up in the DP700, but useful to know. And this list could be a lot longer, but these are probably two of the main things is what's your appetite or your requirement to customize the environment. Now with a lake house, it's fairly highly configurable. You can change a lot of different settings about the underlying delta format. You can do things like repartitioning, very simply, you can change a lot of the Spark environment settings. With a data warehouse, you don't have access to a lot of the what's going on under the hood. So if you're a SQL developer coming from Azure SQL, for example, or SQL Server, you're not going to have access to a lot of the administration tool sets that you once had available to you. That's kind of like a, a positive and a negative, I guess, depending on what your, your goal is. But the way that it's described is that, you know, they manage this for you, a lot of the under the hood optimizations. So there's very few optimizations that we can really do in a data warehouse. One of them being turning on or off the order rights. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail when we talk about the optimization section, which is one of the last sections. But just know that in general, if you're looking for a highly configurable environment and tuning of your underlying Delta tables, then the lake house is probably a better bet for you. If you don't know anything about that and you don't care about that, the warehouse is a pretty good solution. The other one I mentioned is how important to you is Git and CICD. So there are some differences in how these get written to version control and how they get deployed via deployment pipelines, for example. So if that's important for you, then just bear that in mind. The warehouse has more options. You also have the SQL database project available for warehouse deployment, which is not available for lake houses. And in general, more of the things that you change in a warehouse are tracked by Git and version control. Lake house, you kind of have to manage the deployment process yourself with post deployment scripts of creating tables and hydrating those tables yourself. So that's something to bear in mind. So the second decision guide, a lot of the DP700 is asking you to make decisions about which would be the best thing in this scenario. Where should you land your data? In the previous data store example, which of these would make sense for this particular scenario? You also receive questions asking you to choose between different methods for data ingestion and transformation. Now there's a wide variety of options and decision points for how you might make these decisions. Again, there is a decision guide in the documentation for specifically these kind of coding type artifacts. So the data transformation and ingestion tools. And I've also added in my own little column here for T-SQL because that's also important for making these decisions that's not in the documentation. So again, let's talk through some of the main decision points and when we might want to choose one of these over the other. Okay, so let's start at the top here. So the, the use case section. Well, the data pipeline primarily is for data ingestion, 
and orchestration. So if you ever get a question around that it needs to be some sort of heavy transformation, you're not gonna get that from a data pipeline, essentially. You can do basic transformation, right? But it's, yeah, lightweight transformation, as it says here. But you can't do a lot of filtering and adding new columns. You can do some of that. But you know, if you want more than just the very, very basic transformation, it's gonna push you into one of these other ones, right? So data flows, as we know, we can use Power Query and M to do transformations. Spark, you can obviously, the world is your oyster there. You can do whatever you want. T-SQL, again, you can do whatever you want in terms of transformations. So that's one of the first decision points, right? The, the amount of transformations that you need to do in this tool. The second one I would mention is the skill set, right? So a common phrase that you might hear in an exam would be your solution should minimize development effort. And what that phrase essentially means is what's well, not likely going to be something to do with Spark or T-SQL because they're required development most of the time. So obviously it depends on the question, right? And the answers, you can't just guess these particular things. But when you hear that phrase, it's going to be one of these low and no code tools. So it might be a data pipeline, might be a data flow gen two. It could also be things like shortcuts and mirroring, right? Because they really minimize development efforts. They don't require any ETL at all. So that's something you might hear in an exam that you just need to be aware of. Now, an obvious one here is the skill set. Again, that minimized development effort. If your team are primarily coming from like an analytics or BI background, they're going to be very familiar with Dataflows Gen 2. So if someone knows Power Query and M really well, obviously that's a key decision point. If you have Python data engineers in your organization, then Spark is going to be a good tool for data transformations. Equally, you know, if you're a T-SQL shop, T-SQL is a good choice there. Data volume is, according to Microsoft, not really a decision point. They're all low to high. We'll leave it at that for now. The development interface is you know, similar to this low code and no code environment, right? It's like, do you want to be writing code or do you want a nice UI to perform your transformations and your ingestion? Now, the sources and the destinations are most of the time a really important signifier, at least definitely for data ingestion and sometimes for transformation as well. Although it's mainly for data ingestion where the sources and the destination comes into play. So it's really important to know in an exam, they might give you a wide variety of different sources in various different questions. Now, these sources make a big difference on which tools we can use to ingest them. Because some sources are only really ingestible, if that's a word, via certain items in Fabric. Good example here is on-premise data. So if you ever hear on-premise data, immediately your mind should go towards the data pipeline or the data flow gen two, right? Because they allow you to create this connection via the on-premise data gateway. Equally, although it's not mentioned in this slide, we're gonna talk about it afterwards, right? Any of your sources are sources that can be used with shortcuts or mirroring. So if an ADLS gen two storage account is mentioned, then immediately your mind should start flashing with, oh, this could be a shortcuts question. And that's not necessarily the case because you can also ingest data from ADLS Gen 2 via practically all of these, right? Well, yeah, all of these. So yeah, depends on the question, but just be very careful about the sources that are mentioned in DP700 questions. The destinations are a little bit more unique. And again, if the question or if your requirement in the business, just ignoring the exam, if your requirement is we need to ingest some data into a data warehouse. Well, again, that's gonna direct you towards either you can use T-SQL depending on the source, or it's gonna push you towards some of these ones, right? It's gonna rule out using Spark because that's quite difficult to load directly into a, a data warehouse using Spark. So yeah, just be careful on the sources and the destinations. Okay, let's move on to shortcuts. So a shortcut in Microsoft Fabric, it allows you to essentially create references to, in this case, we're gonna start talking about external data sources, okay? So if your data lives in any of these external sources, so Amazon S3, Amazon S3 compatible, which means the sources that use Amazon S3 APIs. So things like Cloudflare, R2, for example, essentially anything that uses Amazon S3 under the hood can also be used like this. ADLS Gen 2, Azure Data Lake Storage, Dataverse, so any data that you've got in Power Apps or also Dynamics 365 as well can also be brought in via this method. Google Cloud Storage is another one as well. Very simple to do. If you're within a lake house, you can just do get data, new shortcut. And as long as you have all of the required networking and security set up, 
You know, it's going to allow you to bring in that data very simply. I also have internal shortcuts here. So if your data already lives in one lake, it's in a different lake house or data warehouse, for example, you can connect to that data and bring it into this lake house like so. So this is just a visualization of all those different options, really. So if you have a lake house, you need to create the lake house yourself first, but then you can shortcut all of these different objects into them. Now you can either shortcut individual files, but normally it's a folder. Now, the one that I would just point out here is that Apache Iceberg files are also now supported in preview. So if you're using Snowflake and your underlying Iceberg files in Snowflake are stored in some sort of external storage in any of these, you can also now shortcut to those. You can also create a mirrored table from Snowflake, but we'll look at that shortly. And a shout out to Miles Cole for creating the Excalidraw Fabric Icons plugin. Now, this is just a reminder, a bit of a callback to the first week when we talked about workspace settings. So shortcut caching is a workspace setting in your fabric workspaces. And I just want to remind you that it allows you to create a cache inside of fabric with essentially with the goal to minimize egress fees from these platforms here. It's available for these tools. So Amazon S3, S3 compatible, Google Cloud Storage. It's not available for ADLS Gen 2, because it's already in the Azure cloud, it's not particularly necessary. And there's a few key rules. Remember the 24 hour rule. So if your cache has not been accessed within Fabric for 24 hours, then it's gonna be removed, that cache. And any files greater than one gigabyte are not gonna be cached. So just a quick reminder there. Let's talk about mirroring. So mirroring is a feature that allows you to mirror a supported database into Fabric, essentially creating a near real-time replica of your table in one of the supported source environments into Fabric. It allows us to avoid doing traditional ETL. You can create a mirror database from within a workspace, right? Just click on new item. If you search for mirror, you'll see these supported mirrors. It's gonna create a entirely new artifact. So you can see the supported sources here. We've got Azure Cosmos DB, Azure SQL database, which is GA. A lot of these are still in preview. So Azure SQL mirrored a managed instance is also in preview. Mirrored Snowflake is GA, I believe. Now this one is quite interesting here. So the mirrored database preview, this is like a generic mirroring solution. This is a brand new feature, well, relatively new feature. You might have heard of open mirroring. So rather than creating all these different mirrors for individual database providers like this, now Microsoft have said, well, actually we're just gonna make a generic mirroring solution that any of these providers can write connectors into, right, quite simply. The way that it works, this open mirroring solution at the bottom, it's gonna provide you with a landing zone and you're gonna to need to write Parquet files in a specific format, essentially with some encoding as to whether it's an insert or a delete or an update within that Parquet file. And it's gonna manage that entire update process for you and kind of manage your mirror for you if you keep on sending these Parquet files into that landing zone. But that is a preview feature, so unlikely you're gonna get tested on that in the exam, but useful to know. I think it could be very big in the future. And the other one I've highlighted here is the Azure Databricks catalog, so the Unity catalog mirroring, which is essentially what's called like metadata mirroring. So it's just mirroring the catalog itself, so the metadata, not all of the tables within your catalog. Essentially how it works is just gonna mirror the metadata and then it kind of shortcuts, or uses shortcuts under the hood, or at least my understanding of it. It's more similar to shortcuts than mirroring. And it allows you to see what's in your Unity catalog and it brings that into the Fabric environment. Again, that one's still a preview feature, so you know, good to be aware of, might not be in the exam. So this is what this looks like, right? In your Fabric workspace, it's gonna look a bit like this. So the one that I didn't mention there was the Fabric SQL database, which is this one here. And with the Fabric SQL database, you get an automated mirror into a mirrored SQL database here. So obviously your OLTP database in Fabric, it automatically writes into like a, a Delta version of that database so that you can use it across other experiences as well. Here's our Azure SQL, Managed Instance, Cosmos DB, Snowflake, and Databricks Unity Catalog. And this solution down at the bottom is my interpretation of open mirroring here. Okay, we'll leave it there for this video. I hope you enjoyed that one. Make sure you join us for the next session because we're gonna be getting hands-on in Fabric and we're gonna be doing a bit of a deep dive into 
all of the elements of T-SQL that are useful for data engineers and for the DP700. So I'll see you there.